Services. Uh, we're um, a planning consultancy firm uh, in Utah, and uh, it's my pleasure to work with a number of you. I've had an association now for a number of years with various counties across the state, so it's good to see some uh, friends here. I value your friendship um, that we've been able to develop through uh, working on your general plans and zoning orders. So, Good to see uh, Dave Lovanger here from Cobbin County and a number from Miller County. Um, Kane County is represented by a senior. Friends from Weaver County and Morgan County. Uh, if I, I know I'm going to miss something. Uh, but it's good to see everyone here. Thank you for letting me come. The other thing that I do uh, for the fun of it is I also teach a number of classes and plans at the University of Utah. And now is about the time I would say to students put away your laptops, your cell phones. Turn off all the electronic devices because we're getting folks to move down the hatch. So, but I understand that's not the case here. So we're actually going to adopt the technology. So, particularly those people in the back, can see some of the material I can present up here. So, please, I want you to pull out your laptop, cell phones, and follow along with me, um, if that's okay. Um, and uh, because I've said in the back there a moment ago. Um, and as uh, you get your eyes off the page, you don't see as well uh, some material. Um, so, so we'll take our time and we'll, we'll cover um, a number of things. It's just an absolutely spectacular day outside. And why are you in the basement of a building in South Georgia? That's a question. Garden level. Thank you. Ronnie tells me it's garden level. The reason you are doing that is because of your commitment to your community. Uh, you live in some of the best communities, I believe, in the world. And you are some of the best residents of those communities because of your commitment to your communities and uh, fellow citizens. So my congratulations to you for all you do to enhance and improve the communities in which you will live. Um, and when I say communities, I'm talking about counties, uh, because I think a county is a community of people living together. Um, and working together to achieve mutual interest and goals. And we'll talk about what the planning is a little bit at the moment. Uh, John did a great job covering that, and I just want to sort of make a link between planning um, and zoning as well. So thank you very much for your commitment. I very much appreciate um, all the effort you give. Um, as a resident of the state of Utah, I get to benefit as I travel around the state from the work you do um, and to enjoy just the beauty that we're. It's really blessed with. Um, although I think our friends in Iron County can do better. Um, right, Chad? Hey, hey. <laughs> but, but thank you very much for all you do. It's very much appreciated. So, today, we, someone said they'd like to talk about zoning. Is that true? I, I put together a presentation in a vacuum. Um, and I thought it might be things you would like to think about and talk about. But I might be completely wrong. So I want you to tell me what you would like to achieve in the next hour and, I'm going to say 30 minutes, in the next 90 minutes as we we've discussed in the other zoning. What would you like to achieve? What are the goals that you would like to give, the benefit that you would like to take home after this session today? Anyone? Anyway. How to make everybody happy. How to make everyone happy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is relatively easy. <laughs> It happens on the 25th of December <laughs> of each year. There's a really a, a wonderful spirit around this time of year. And people are generally happy that time. Although the, the challenge that we have is to maintain that sense of spirit and feeling we had on the 25th of December throughout the year. And they've actually had songs about that. And Sesame Street's a good example of that. How do you continue that feeling throughout the year? So we'll try and keep everyone happy, and I'll try and leave that in my topics and discussion and words I have to you today. Anything else? Make it a little hard, please. What questions do you have about zoning? Well, as we go along, have you, as, as they pop into your mind, please stop me, because I want to make sure that I respond to your questions and achieve your goals for today. So here was my outline of what I would like to discuss with you. Again, created in a vacuum, right? Because I sat in my office one day last week and pulled this together and thought maybe uh, the county uh, commissioners, county planning commission members, county staff would like to have a discussion about 
uh, planning and why we do plans, and I'd like to give you some examples. And then I'd like to give you a, an overview of the history of zoning with some Utah examples, why you do zoning. And by the way, I think I discovered in the year 2000, the last county that had, did, didn't have zoning in the state of Utah in the year 2000. Um, because of my efforts, I'm sorry to say, they've now adopted the, a zoning document. Does anyone have any, any guess what, what county that might have been? The last one that I knew of. Probably that. Paiute County, Butch Cassidy was raised. Oh, thank you Paiute. very much, <laughs> Mr. Nay. Thank you. Butch Cassidy, and I appreciate going down to that area because it's named Bruce Parker. What was Butch Cassidy's real name, Chad? Leroy Parker. Exactly. Exactly. So people ask me, now, are you related to Butch? I said, well, no, my accent, I'm from the south. <laughs> um, and I'm from further south than you, you, you appreciate. So, um, so, no, I'm not a relative of which, but I really like going down to Circleville and those areas and Beaver County and, and Beaver, where he grew up and then spent his summers in Circleville, right? Working at the butcher shop. And that's how he got his name. Um, so, it's, 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 it's a great community. So, thank you. Um, so, I want to, to achieve some examples of, of, of zoning in, in Utah. So, was it Paiute, though? It was Paiute. I was just right. I just guessed because I was Excuse right. me. It was Paiute. It was Paiute, correct? Um, and then, are there any rules about zoning? I'd like to give you some examples about those. And then, I'd like you to ask me some questions, and you can see maybe I can give you some answers. But it's a maybe. I'm not guaranteeing anything. And then, we would have a conclusion and discussion. Is that okay? But please add anything you would like to that outline as we go along. So let's see if I can show this along. So let me link back to. Let me link back. Sorry about that. Let me link back to the discussion that John just had with you about um, planning and why do why do we do what we do? Think about that for a moment. Why do you plan? Said, by the way, I love it. See the latest one with the chicken rolling around? I thought that was you. Yeah. <laughs> Open range chickens just want to be free. They're riding the rails and they're all around town. I love that. So, um, why do we do planning? Why? So, before I answer that question, I would like to take you back for a moment to the history of flight. Um, and I know we have a difficult week with the crash in, in France, but um, my uncle was in the Air Force and spent a number of years in the Air Force, so he got me excited about flight. And I just love going to the airport and I love watching planes take off and seeing all those things and just modern technology. It's wonderful. But, um, yeah. but if we just go back for a moment and reflect on the history of flight and aviation, in 1903, there was a gentleman by the name of Charlie Taylor who invented a small engine with a pretty good power to weight ratio, which allowed the Wright brothers to get the Kitty Hawk off the ground. And it was his invention of that small engine that allowed uh, both Wilbur and Orville to start to fly. Um, and then later in that same year, December 17th, uh, 1903, the Wright brothers took four flights on the same day. Um, and for those, two of those flights, they flew for 120 feet and 200 feet, 1903. And then in 1905, they're getting a bit more school, technology is moving along. Um, Wilbur takes a flight and stays airborne for 38 minutes flying 24 miles. 
And then in 1908, Orwell takes a passenger with him and flies for one hour. 1908. Amazing. Um, they start to fly and take a, take a passenger um, in 1908. So where are we today? So here we are. Uh, this is a 747 400 series, um, decked out in British Airways livery. Um, and you can see some of the specifications of a 747. Um, the weight empty is 403,000 pounds. Um, it carries an additional nearly 386,000 pounds of fuel. Um, and a payload, total payload of 138,000 pounds. So the maximum takeoff weight for the 747 is 870,000 pounds. Now, the first 747 flew in uh, 1974, just about 70 years after all the Wilbur flew. 70 years. An amazing technology change when our beneficiaries off spill. And these are the workhorses still of the commercial aviation industry, 747. Um, a maximum landing weight of 585,000 uh, pounds, and then a wing area of 5,500 square feet. Now, I know this doesn't apply to counties, but that's larger than some lots in Salt Lake County. Um, the wing area, the, 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 the area of the wing. Um, so, let's, have, let's continue this discussion for a moment. You can see this is United Airlines, the same, same model of Boeing 747. Um, the long-range commercial uh, four uh, quad turbo fan engines that are either, either Pratt & Whitney, that's a PMW, uh, General Electric, General Electric, or Rolls-Royce. And those four engines, each individual engine, uh, can generate a thrust of about 60,000 pounds. Nothing like the rocket that Morton Firecall or ATK tested uh, last week, which would have 22 million uh, pounds. So, but these are fairly su substantial engines, uh, and when they're um, configured for passenger service, a maximum of 420 passengers. So, here's the one that takes me home, uh, sometimes. Um, the cruise altitude is uh, somewhere between 28,000 and 35,000 feet. Uh, the long range cruising speed is 495 knots with a maximum of 510. And then the maximum range is 8,380 miles, non-stop, on, a, on a, a, a full load of fuel. The longest non-stop flight today in, in the world is a flight to Sydney, Australia, that originates in Dallas, Texas. Non-stop, 16 and a half hours. Um, and if they run into a little bit of headwind, they can't quite make it. <laughs> so what they do? Run out of fuel. What does the pilot do? He diverts. He's got to land in Brisbane, Australia, which is about 400 miles different. So it's getting close. I remember once before we had all the things with uh, terrorist activity and that, and I took my family to Australia, and we got to get up into the on the flight deck of the Quantic 747. And I said to the pilot, I said, "How much fuel do you have when you take off?" And gave you these numbers: nearly 600,000 pounds of fuel. How much do you have when you get to Sydney? We've got 75,000 pounds left. How much is that? Where can you get to that? Well, if Sydney's closed, we'll go to Brisbane or Melbourne, and that's it. We're going to make a choice which way we're going. So this is an amazing piece of technology that I think it takes for granted, and we've moved this far in 100 years. And so why would I be talking about aviation and flight? Um, why would I have a discussion with you about that in, in the context of zoning? Well, let me introduce a couple of the fundamental principles to you of flight that have never changed and still the same today. And Wilbur and all the right knew these just like the engineers and the flight technicians and the aeronautical engineers at both. The lift that the plane can generate from the wings must be greater than its weight or you're never going to take off. And the thrust generated from the engines must be greater than the drag generated by the, the air coming against the frame of the plane. 
they have two fundamental principles of aviation. If either of those are violated, you are not going very far, or if you can get off the ground, you're not going very far vertically, you're going to drop. So there are two principles of flight that still exist today that all and Wilbur struggled with when they were back in 1903 working on the Kitty Hawk, um, excuse me, at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, trying to get their plane to fly 120 feet. They were, tra they were traveling the world nonstop 8,300 miles. So the question to you, what are the rules? What are the principles that apply to planning, just like they do to aviation? And then what are the principles and rules of zoning? And do any of those exist? And if so, what are they? What are the rules for planning? And then what are the rules for zoning? If any. If any. Or we're just out there winging <laughs> using my aviation pun. Are we just hoping for the best as we go along? Sure. It probably wouldn't be good for those big planes to be landing in downtown Salt Lake City. Wouldn't be good for them, but we we, we we worked that out. We have a plan. We have an international airport just out the way here. Exactly, exactly. We have an appropriate zone for those things to land. So, what are the rules? So, let me discuss with you about what I think they may be. But before I do, let me go back and talk about the history of planning and zoning in the state. I'm sorry for the quality of the image. This is Ensign Peak, Salt Lake City. This is where really planning started in the state of Utah. Um, apparently, I'm just going to guess that I think that some of you may be of the religion that walked up the field with Brigham Young as their leader and said, hey, this is a good place, we should start, we should live here. And that happened four days before they went up in Saint Peter and said, we need to start thinking about a plan for the community in which we all live. We can't let these larrikins in behind us that are coming from the Midwest just come and run rampant over the landscape. We need a plan. We need a plan for that. And so we went up the top of this mountain, this hill here in Salt Lake and said, let's start laying out our community. And in a, as a way of recognizing that, Residents of the state scurried around to the 29 counties of this state and brought back a number of rocks. And we built an obelisk on the top of uh, Anson Peak. And if you happen to hike up there, you'll see that up there. And it's recognized that all the counties of the state are memorialized and recognized. And this is where the settlement of Utah really started. On the top of Anson Peak, where Brigham Young said, Listen, um, Polly, listen, Lawson, get with it. You guys need to start lay, laying out our community. We just didn't bring you along for the ride. You haven't walked across half of the US for the fun of it. I want you to get busy. You've had four days off <laughs> since we arrived. Get on with it, right? So they did. And they said, oh, but bring it. We got, a, we got a plan, and it's not our plan. One of our earlier church leaders, Joseph Smith, had this idea, a plan of Zion. And this is what we did when we were back in Illinois and other communities of, of Kansas and those areas. We laid out a community space on a plan because we, we had a prophet that said this is why we should do it. Right? And we think this might apply here. We think this might be a good way to go. So look, so this was their, their plan of Zion idea. And so the two people that, that, that Rigman asked, Polly P. Pratt um, and Wilson Hyde, to lay out Salt Lake, follow this plan. A very physical plan was ge geographically based. There was no you know, real, well, what's the social fabric of the community? There was no, what's the cultural goal? We just want to have a, a, an attractive community in which to live, and it was very physical. So they started to lay it out. And so this is downtown Salt Lake. So this is the first uh, image of the layout of Salt Lake that I can find. Um, so here we have Temple Square right here. And if your eyes were better, sorry, 
um, you would be able to see some of the illuminaries of the early pioneers on property around this area. Um, let me give you an example. Here we have uh, Brigham Young himself and a gentleman by the name of Kimball and a few others. And then over here we have uh, a, a John Smith and E. Smith. Um, so we started to divide up property and, and people took ownership. And so this is what um, Salt Lake started to look like as they started to lay it out. Um, based on the plant and plant design idea, based on the plant, now we're starting to lay out a community which we'd like to achieve. Any questions so far about it? Isn't this exciting? <laughs> this is great. Think about it. We can learn so much from history. We don't have to be always looking forward so much. We can look back as well and learn from what worked and what didn't work uh, in these communities. So, this is Salt Lake County, circa 1930. This is the location of about 3,500 east and about 40 or so. This is about where Skyline High School is, if you know where that area is. Um, a lot of development going on, right? This looks like uh, your town in many areas. Um, about 1935, thereabouts. Main Street, Salt Lake City, 1875. Um, you can see that we had this new idea, mixed use. <laughs> mixed use, where we'll have commercial on the bottom and residential and, and some sort of office above. Think about where we are in Salt Lake, 1875. What's between here and Nevada? Not a whole lot. But we went up instead of down. We, we went vertical instead of horizontal. And so there is an interesting concept of creating a sense of downtown, a sense of community, where we had this idea of mixed use. And we hear now it's coming back. But 1875. And if you have parking problems, if you have parking problems, Mayor Anderson, this is Rocky Anderson, we can park in the median, right here, where these this, these bullocks and cows, or what do they call it? What do they call these things? Oxen. Oxen, thank you. They just, when you get a little tired, they just poop. And that's where they, they stopped, and that's where we call it parking. And we, and we had main, and we had on-street parking. Now, I know this is a very urban discussion with a bunch of county folks, but this is interesting stuff. This is, this is the history of Salt Lake. And these were gathering places. The street was a gathering place. Now, I'm sorry for the quality of my image. This is an old one. This is about 19... No, this is about 1890. If you can see up here, it says commission. I don't think that's the county commission offices, though. Because above it says um, auction and storage and commission. So it looks like it's a gathering place. They're having actually an auction on the street of downtown Salt Lake. But we had these public spaces that were actually used. And so here's a, a group of people engaging in their civic activities and affairs right on Main Street, Salt Lake. About 1890. So we had a plan, we stuck at it for a while, we didn't change the plan too much, we thought it was a great idea. Uh, we had it since uh, Joseph Smith brought it uh, in about 1830 or so. We stuck at it long enough and we started to achieve a community which we were proud of. This is the State Fair Park, University of Utah, uh, up in this area here. This is about 9 south in Salt Lake. Uh, you can see the temple and, and the tabernacle, downtown Salt Lake right here. Uh, again, about 1880, 85, 90 period. Um, there's an interesting rule. If you've got a plan, you've got a good plan, stay out. Achieve something. Just a comment there on that, Bruce. I wish their influence had been as great as it was over here on the uh, East Coast because Joseph Smith's plan, those of us that have spent time over there on the East Coast know how hard it is to get around over there on their narrow streets and so forth. So right from the get-go, it was good planners over here, good stewards. Well, we had these streets 135, 132 feet wide. Yeah. And block faces is 660. And now we're benefiting from it because not only is it easy to get around, 
But now we're able to retrofit them with tracks and those sort of things as well. We can have 747s on What? <laughs> we can have a 747 on the clear down too. Thank you, Chad. Come out to show, please. Cheryl, good job. Um, so, so here we are, sticking in a plan long enough and achieving it via implementation actions of people working together. I just didn't go out there and try and do my thing or someone else did their thing. Um, we had this plan in place to achieve a goal. And, and this uh, plan was recognized nationally uh, in the late uh, 1900s. Uh, I think this was about, when was this, 18, excuse me, 1996. Um, the American Planning Association, which John and I are members of, recognized the planning, the plan of design as a national honor for, for what? For what? How it laid out the template, the fabric of building communities across the way. It wasn't just software. It was St. Jude. It was Logan. It was the communities that you lived in. It was Delta. Right? It was Nevada. It was Arizona. It went to Canada. So, so the plan of Zion had a huge influence on the settlement of the West. See the city. Las Vegas. Believe it or not. They only have stuff in Las Vegas. I can't believe that. No. <laughs> Are you sure? That's why the temple's the highest. No. Okay. So the point is, um, this plan of Zion was recognized as a national honor, um, as a contribution to communities. Not just planning, but to communities and the welfare and well-being of people. So here's Salt Lake City. This is six leaves. Uh, this is a residential street. We talked about these streets being 132 feet wide, but they weren't all that wet in black top or concrete. Um, some of those areas were softened uh, with significant median plantings and large street trees on the side to add a residential amenity and integrity to the community. They weren't all commercial. And those that were, we put in the appropriate infrastructure. Here's an interesting slide for me as a planner. That before we even black topped the road, we had mass transit which we go and put back and call the track. And we have street trees, and we have sidewalks so people can walk around. So, so this is an interesting, this is about 1905. So this is an interesting um, way we developed our community uh, back in, in those early days. And it wasn't just Salt Lake, this is St. George. Uh, we put in infrastructure, water and sewer lines uh, to support our community and how things have changed. St. George, 1961. It looks, it looks a little bit like this. It's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. And our communities will continue to change. So, oh, extra slide here. And it wasn't just Salt Lake. Where is this? Washington, D.C. Who, was who, who laid out Washington, D.C.? Who? <laughs> Who was it? Yeah. Pierre Lafon. This French guy came and laid out Washington, D.C. in the direction of, of uh, George Washington. Laid it out. And taken it back to a Stephen Colbert episode where he's interviewing, interviewing um, the director of uh, acquisitions and collections at the Metropolitan Museum of Art who painted uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware. Who painted that? He's a German. Painted in Germany, brought to New York for exhibition. Pierre Lafont, uh, designs and lays out Washington, D.C. Statue of Liberty, French. In the words of Stephen Colbert, why do we have all these foreigners doing our work? <laughs> <laughs> it was like the chicken. Anyhow, so what is planning? What is planning? Let me suggest to you today that you've made already a number of planning decisions. You decided to come to this training workshop. For good or for bad. You could be doing other things. You could have stayed at home, you could have stayed in your office, you could have toured the county, checked out the beauty that surrounds you. You could have enjoyed the day, you could have gone golfing, but you decided in your planning to come here. Um, and it was a good self-conscious activity that you engaged in. Um, so you've already, depending on how we define planning, you've already uh, 
committed a number of planning decisions today and engaged in that process. So, here's my definition of planning, if I could. Um, this is taken from the American Planning Association. Now, their definition of planning is quite lengthy. And so this is what I recommend and this is what I suggest to my planning students at the U to think about what planning is. This is a synopsis of a definition of planning. Planning is, and, and very rarely do we find what planning is. I'm sad to say. I work in a department called the Department of City of Metropolitan Planning at the U in the College of Architecture Planning. And very rarely do we find what planning is about. So this is my attempt, my small and feeble attempt, admittedly, to try and correct that. Planning is efforts to improve the welfare of people and their communities, and we can define them to include counties, cities, towns, villages, towns, whatever they may be, and incorporated areas, by creating more convenient, equitable, healthful, efficient, and attractive places that enrich the lives of present and future generations. What do you think about that? You ever thought about planning in those terms? That John talked to you a moment ago about doing your planning, how it will help your community now. I suggest to you that the greatest thing you're doing with your planning activities is benefiting future generations. We are beneficiaries today of the planning that occurred in Salt Lake in 1847. And we are benefiting from that work today. So I'm going to suggest to you, you will never potentially see the results uh, of the great work you do. But your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will be beneficiaries of your work and commitment to your community. So thank you very much for all you do. So now let's get down to a uh, discussion about zoning. So John talked to you about the value of the county general plan, um, and I'm going to suggest to you that the county general plan provides a framework, a foundation, if you will, for the other implementation tools that you have available, one of which is your zoning document. Subdivision documents are another one, subdivision ordinances, your capital improvements plan documents and how you fund your improvements, your annual budget is a way that you implement your plan by the priority decisions you take. Um, but zoning, um, let's stay on zoning for a moment, because there's plenty to talk about. Um, so the, your plan then sets the foundation for going forward and talking about zoning. So we've got to talk about what is the purpose of your county zoning ordinance, and I've left a question mark for you. By the way, I'm going to give you some homework to take on. some homework. I can't break the lecture of them all too easily. By the way, we're trying to do a different way of teaching it for you. It's called flipping courses. Whereas I would send you out this document on your laptop and you would read it at home. And then you would come, come in to the lecture um, to have any questions or discussion about important points or topics that you thought were very interesting. So I'm going to encourage us to do that a little bit as we go along too. So in that spirit, Anyone got any comment, questions, topics we'd like to chat with about before we move on? Hey, Bruce, just a quick question. Would you suggest a drip to adopt that general plan by resolution or ordinance? Which method would you pick? A very good question. I should have done both ways, Chad. And I'll defer to your county attorney. Remember the general plan is a policy document. It's not a law, it's a policy. So many, many attorneys will recommend, because of because it's a policy, let's adopt it by resolution. It doesn't have the force of law. Many will say that. Some will say, no, let's do it by ordinance. Because then it becomes more strong and in, 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 in place. But the zoning ordinance has got to be adopted by ordinance. So now we have the county attorney from Miller County with a comment. Please go ahead, Richard. Well, the former county attorney. The former county attorney, deputy there, county attorney. There was attorney. A, uh, a Supreme Court case, Spencer back where the general plan was an issue and the and while you, it's correct it's not it's not a law if you look at zoning ordinance themselves 
It certainly is enforceable, as the Supreme Court says. I mean, it's not. It's more than just directive. It is. I cannot remember the name of that case. You may be familiar with it. But but they put gave a lot of emphasis on that general plan and uh, the need for a city or a county to follow it. The need to follow it exactly, exactly. Not just be out there. Not just have it out there as a simply as a rule of thumb. Right. Thank you. Thank you. But that's the difference adopted by resolution or by ordinance, right? What's e either way. Either way. It's important. It's an important articulation of public policy of how you're going to proceed. So I want to talk about the implementation, implementation strategies that are available for the county ordinance, uh, county zoning ordinance, to the general plan and those sort of things, and talk about compliance a little bit. So where am I up to? So here is what we have in state law 1727A. Uh, and I do the X set because um, the numbering starts to move around a little bit every time uh, the state legislature meets. Those little fixes. For 45 days, you've got to be on your toes, my friends. See what they're up to. So, unlike, unlike the general plan, let's be clear, your county, the legislative body of your county, the county council, or the county commissioners, um, may, may, may adopt a zoning one and, it, and it accompany the zoning map, which is the articulation of the rules of the zoning orders applied to the ground, the geography of your community, your county. So it's a spatial thing, the zoning map. But you may do it. You don't have to. But I think 29 counties in this state, are you can be in the last one, 2000, have adopted zoning orders. So, in their ultimate wisdom, the state legislature, including the House of Representatives and the Senate, have said, this is something that we shouldn't be involved in. This is something that's best left to the local decision makers and the people in the communities that know their county. So let's delegate planning and zoning to the residents of the county. Let's do that. That's a great idea. Let's make a motion. All four? Everyone. Good. So now you have the obligation and the responsibility and the privilege of doing uh, a zoning ordinance in your community by way of delegation of state powers that are resting in the state but now are being delegated to you at the local level to get on with planning and zoning. Please stop me at any time. So here are the rules of planning that I'm going to suggest to you. Remember my rules of flight? Here's a couple. The first of all, comply with applicable state rules. Follow whatever the state law says you can do and can do. And then comply with your local laws like the deputy county attorney said. If you've got some rules in place, follow them. Simple as that. If you don't like it, change them. So there are my first two rules, principles, policies, and so on. Follow state law and follow the local rules that you have in place. So he's a cute couple. Out on their first day, got on it. Got on it. Doesn't this take you back to the first time you dated your wife, sitting somewhere, chatting? Mm, how's it going to work out? Mm, not too sure. Um, <laughs> What's he doing that sort of weird is bugging me? <laughs> or, or what is he doing that's bugging me? Dating your daughter. Let's not be, let's not be, be sexist in any way. Dating your daughter. Huh? Yeah. Dating your daughter. Right. And, uh, uh, sleepless, sleepless nights. Sleepless nights for pops. That is your daughter, isn't it? Yeah, right. No, it's, it's not. not. <laughs> Here's my question to you. When was your first date? Not personally. When was your first date in your county? When did you adopt the first zoning ordinance? What day did your county commission, board of county commissioners, adopt your first zoning ordinance? July 1965, is that what it was? Why is that date important? Because every use that existed prior to that date is either, it's legal, illegal, right? They're all legal uses, right? If they haven't changed them. So they're either legal non-conforming or legal conforming, as based on the zoning ordinance that you adopted. 
and continue to be that way until it's changed. But they're all legal because they were in place before you adopted the zoning laws in 1965, right? So, the next principle. Know the dates of when you do things. Track that. And when you make changes. Because that's affecting someone's land use rules, right? Some private property rights. Either goodly, in a good way or a bad way. So, when was your first date? I can't even remember that one when it was with my own wife. Let's think. It was in February 1983. I think. <laughs> I'm glad she's not here, by the way. <laughs> Here's some terms. Get to know these terms that are in the County Land Use Development and Management Act, that 1727 A thing, which you've never really go to. Here's some terms. What is a land use ordinance? A plan. Zoning development or subdivision ordinance of the county but does not include the general plan. This is right out of state law. A land use application. Any application required by a county's land use ordinance. Well, I require an application for permitted use, conditional use, temporary use, seasonal use, whatever it may be. I, I, no, that's a land use application. And we have these land use authorities. That sounds pretty official. An authority. Any person, board, commission, agency, or other body designated by the local legislative body, i.e. your county council, county commissioners, etc., to act upon a land use application. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. Let me reserve that one because I want to come back. That's truly important. And then a land use permit, any permit issued by the land use authority, i.e. I issue you a permit, permitted use, conditional use, that becomes a land use permit, right? I typically do it in writing. I send you a note, fill out a form, say, congratulations, you're approved for conditional use to operate a residential facility for trouble girls and boys. Maximum number, 500. Um, just make sure you behave yourself. My conditions of approval is behave yourself. So, a few more terms. And you need to get to know these. What is a culinary water authority, a sanitary sewer authority, a fire authority, an affected entity, an appeals authority, a public hearing, a public meeting? None of these. Check. And your ordinance, I believe, should have these included in the definitional material that you have. Now, as a nod, and I told Molly Stevens I would do this, as a nod to Molly, she was at the Christmas party in Miller County, she said she had chickens. In the, in the terminology of Australia, chooks, chooks that lay blue eggs. I said, kid. Kid. Chooks lay blue eggs. Chickens lay blue eggs. I don't believe. Well, she said, well, next time you come to a plant commission, I'll bring you down. I said, well. And she sent me, sent me an email saying, you come down tonight? No, Cheryl didn't, it doesn't have a meeting, I'll come down. Well, I'll hold off. And next time you come down, I'm looking forward to getting some blue eggs, right? Here they are. Z let's be clear. Zoning affects property and the regulation affecting the use of property. And the persons who own that property. This is a serious and significant matter that we should be aware of. This is not something that we should be doing in a frivolous way. We're affecting people's well-being. By definition of the planning, on how they use their property and how they can go forward. And it is often a controversial process. Right? Sometimes it is. As I thought about this last week and put together a little a slideshow, a little slide presentation for you, I thought about it. the number of zoning matters I've been involved in and seen and witnessed. I think 95% of the population accepts the value of zoning. Nine